Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the SIBSI, the August SIBSI ANZ Victorian Chapters monthly seminar on pedestrian lighting standards. Before I introduce our speaker, that wonderful smiling young man on our front sheet there, Peter Rees, the Victorian State Manager of Advanced Lighting Technologies. There are a couple of SIBSI matters that I would like to talk about first. If you could just move that to the next slide, Peter. Absolutely. <clears throat> As we are at several different locations for tonight's presentation, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land <clears throat> on which I stand today near Castlemaine, the Jajawarung people, and also acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Next slide. <clears throat> SIBSI is offering a great value proposition this month of 16 months of membership for the price of 12. You've got to get into it. If you become a SIBSI affiliate or graduate this month, you'll be given a 16 month membership subscription, which runs until 31st of December, 2021. <clears throat> Your membership will include all of the following benefits. A subscription to the SIBSI Journal and unlimited free downloads of all building services knowledge guides, as well as the ANZ Regional Quarterly Digital Publication, Engineering Buildings Journal. An opportunity to gain professional recognition with designatory letters and routes to professional registration, CNG, IENG, EngTech. Invitations to hundreds of CPD and networking opportunities organised by and for building services engineering professionals. Say 15% of SIBSI online learning modules and virtual learning courses. Membership to SIBSI's five societies and 19 special interest groups. You can apply for affiliate membership online at sibsi.org slash affiliate. Early this month, SIBSI ANZ was pleased to announce their finalists for the Young Engineers Award 2020. We'd like to invite you to celebrate the student graduate and young engineer finalists at an online award ceremony taking place from 4pm on Tuesday the 8th of September 2020. Mm -hmm. We will announce the winner of each category and share the winning video submissions at this event. We'll also be joined by Dr Kate Meyer from the Planetary Accounting Network who will deliver a short presentation titled Building Within planetary boundaries. It should be a world beating event. This event free to attend and offers one hour of SIBSI CPD. We mm -hmm. hope you'll enjoy us. Register at sibsi.org forward slash ANZYEA. Next slide there Peter. <clears throat> We've got a fantastic seminar series coming up next month. The 2020 vision for a 2030 reality event thought leadership event really brings experts from both sides of the Tasman to share exemplar case studies of regenerative and net zero building practices as well as new information on future policy changes that building owners and services engineers need to understand to minimize future risks to assets both existing and new. This event now offers up to eight hours of CPD live and to take away. <clears throat> In addition to 10 presentations this event will offer delegates the opportunity to learn from additional international case studies and other net zero CPD webinars. Speed network in small break it, breakout groups. Learn about the products and services that can help you tackle the climate emergency and help you deliver net zero buildings. Register at sibsi.org.au. As a SIBSI ANZ webinar attendee, we know you appreciate the value of the content provided by SIBSI webinars. webinars. For a limited time, SIBSI would like to offer you an additional saving of up to $120 <clears throat> with a $109 ticket to this event. Register by Friday, the 28th of August, 2020, using promotional code event loyalty offer to secure your ticket. SIBSI will also be offering a limited number of free tickets to SIBSI student members. Sign up for free student membership online at sibsi.org forward slash student before 
and you'll be sent a free code on 4th of September to attend this event. Hope to see you there. I'm certainly going. It's going to be an interesting set of speakers. <clears throat> Next slide, Pete. So tonight's presentation is by Peter Rees, Victorian State Manager of Advanced Lighting Technologies. Peter has been working in the lighting industry for the past 13 years, specialising in external lighting, specifically P category for the past six years at Advanced Lighting. As part of their commitment to advancing the education and technical expertise in the industry, Advanced Lighting has put together several seminars to update engineers and latest revisions to the Australian standards. Tonight's seminar will cover AS 1158.3.1 2020, Pedestrian Area Lighting Standards, and will cover the following. Redefined P category terminology, revised LTPs, light technical parameters, additional design categories for car parks, pathways, and connecting elements, new design considerations for pathways, evaluation of glare, UWLW requirements for light sources, and an update to the IP rating, maintenance factors, and CCT requirements. I'd like you to um, welcome Peter, and thank you so much for taking the time out to uh, talk to us this evening. Thank you, Peter. No problem at all. Thank you very much for the opportunity from SIBZ. Um, yeah, very honoured to be here. Thank you very much. So um, you've accurate. You've already you've already done my intro for me, Tony. So thank you very much for that. So that, that pretty <laughs> much tell, tells tells everybody everything they need to know. So. Um, the previous edition of the standard that came out was from 2005. So it had been a little ways uh, from, you know, needing a freshen up. And there was a draft edition back in 2018 and it took a little while to kind of get here and iron out the kinks. But so here we are this year with the, the new ratified document for 2020. So um, no need to kind of reiterate what Tony's already said here, other than if you're not familiar with external lighting in particular, then what governs lighting in public spaces is AS 1158 part three. So the purpose of this standard is, is specifically to make sure that we're, we're lighting for people in external spaces to avoid you know, any issues with hazards and safety and crime and just general sort of well-being at night time in open precincts. So the previous version of this um, standard had some old terminology which they've freshened up and then they've freshened up all the design parameters as well as then adding new metrics like glare and uh, improved maintenance factor methodologies and a few bits and other bits and pieces. So we're gonna focus on those kind of key areas tonight. So if anybody's not really, hasn't had much exposure to external lighting before, um, within the standard, there's an excellent table, figure 2.1, which is a really good roadmap to pretty much every application that you're likely to find in an external environment. Um, and it will lead you to the relevant subcategory that you can start looking at to refine which category you're going to actually design. To. So this was in the previous edition, but it's been updated with all the new terminology. So just to break it down for you, roads uh, used to be P1 to P4. It's now PR1 to 6. Paths and cycleways was P1 to P4. They shared the same category. Uh, they're now separated out into PP1 to PP5. Public activity areas was P6 to P8, that is now PA, one to three. Outdoor car parks, P11, A, B or C previously is now PC, one, two or three. P12 is now PCD. And connecting elements was P9 to 10 is now P1 to three. So the self-enumeric sort of approach to the subcategories, I actually think is a much marked improvement uh, previously. You can sort of identify things by PR, public roads, PP, public pathways, PA, public activity areas. So it's sort of, it's a good mental kind of re reminder of sort of where you need to go. Um, so that's, that's a positive. So we're gonna focus on roads first. So the way that we'll present this presentation tonight is by demonstrating the old standard on the left and then have it highlighting the new standard on the right and then basically reviewing the, the changes that have occurred. So first thing to note, they've changed the, from risk of crime, the terminology for the selection criteria to fear of crime. This seems like a minor thing on the surface, but the general consensus for why they've done this is that there seems to sort of be more and more this um, philosophy that 
because more light doesn't equal a safer environment, that the risk of crime can still be high in an area that's really well lit. The impetus sort of seems to be more on whether or not people will use the spaces based on perception uh, and psychology. And that sort of lends itself to something that's less defined by statistics and more about yeah, how you feel. Therefore, fear of crime is now the main focus of how we determine our category. So that will actually mean a little bit more potential design flexibility for you into how you evaluate your subcategories going forward. Need to enhance amenity versus need to enhance prestige. I don't think there is, I can't see anything in the standard that's particularly sort of enlightening or revelatory about why they've made that, dis that distinction. So not, not too much to comment on that side of things. For roads, it looks like they've added more categories, but they've really consolidated what was two previous tables from the other, from the 2005 version of the standard, and they've just amalgamated them, merged them all into one, one big table. They've modified and adjusted some of the light technical parameters a little bit. And it's just important to note as well that PR3 and 4, they fulfill the same role in this table when you're evaluating for roads. But one is more of a New Zealand standard, PR4 versus PR3, which is used in Australia. And then there is this PR6 category, which is really discretionary and depending on the type of work that you do, may not necessarily come up a bunch. It's a discretionary category used for when you are putting lights on existing distribution poles and lighting roads where you really don't have much control over where you're putting your poles to achieve a certain level of compliance. It's really just, this is sort of the best we can do. And because of that, it has a very, very low lighting requirement. And it's not something that day to day, you, you more than likely see that come up that often. If we now evaluate the actual parameters, the first thing you'll see is that the uniformity is um, it's been tightened up uh, for road lighting and really for every category across the standard. So the way that we measure uniformity externally is different to how we do internally, where you have minimum over average. Externally, we refer to maximum over average because at night time, we're worried about how bright something is versus the average rather than minimums externally because there's darkness everywhere. So the thing that creates that contrast is the maximum. So really what we're trying to do is keep the uniformity under what is nominated there in the table. So anything under eight is, is going to comply with uniformity requirements. For road lighting, there's no longer any vertical element that needs to be calculated for. It's purely horizontal calculations only. So I think it a little bit easier. They've also put in this potential requirement for minimum obtrusive uh, spill light. What does that for road lighting? So what does that what does that really mean? So what they've said in terms of spill light compliance for roads is that it could be a very advantageous idea that when you're considering lighting your road that you're also putting a calculation grid three meters inside the relevant boundary that's adjoining to your site so three meters inside someone's property you're setting up a grid and you aim to achieve 50 percent of your point horizontal levels which sounds a little bit odd i guess because in most instances we are worried about spill light but the reason for it seems to be the way that I can gather is road lighting traditionally and pathway lighting to an extent as well has always been about sort of optimizing pole spacings and keeping the lights stretched as far as they can go for economy. And LEDs create a very precise optic which allow for that. But the negative of that is that sometimes the perception can be that they're a little bit too precise and you end up with these environments where you have a very sharp cutoff between light and dark. So for these very low level uh, road categories, PR3 to 6, the suggestion is, is that there wouldn't be a lot of pooling of light behind the light fittings because the levels are so low. So by adding some spill light, by having to accommodate for up to sort of 50% of your horizontal levels, then you're sort of fulfilling a bit more of a sort of a safety aspect where it creates a bit more of a spill zone. If the relevant authority though is suggesting 4282 compliance, so another Australian standard to consider for spill light, if that is the governing 
uh, design philosophy, then you would ignore this three meter setback approach, but it's just something that they've said is advisable if it's, if it's relevant, if it can be looked at, then it should be. And if we move into pathways, you'll notice that, as I said before, it's a very similar, similar approach to how they're, they're tackling this now as well. We have an extra category now. We had four before, now we have five that we can evaluate, so new selection criteria. And we're also no longer evaluating the need to enhance prestige for external applications. We're just evaluating two selection criteria is how we determine our LUX levels now. It's just the amount of movement and the fear of crime, the perception of crime. In terms of the actual LTPs, PP1, so the old P1 category, has really seen the biggest jump. There's, it's gone from seven LUX previously up to 10 LUX on the horizontal. And then every other design category from the previous standard has sort of fallen in line under that 10 LUX level and all the other levels will look very familiar. The verticals have undergone quite a dramatic shift. So where it used to be that the, hor the minimum horizontal and the minimum vertical levels were on parity with one another, they're now uh, less than what the horizontal levels are. So you'll see that for PP1, you now only need one lux uh, rather than two per the previous standard. And the other thing that might jump out at you as well is the reduction in verticals is also the fact that every category has a vertical component that needs to be achieved. Whereas in the old standard, P4 never had any verticals. There is one exception to that requirement for PP4 and 5, which is that if you have a mounting height under one and a half meters, then you don't need to evaluate vertical compliance. So that is really mainly bollards is the application in a pedestrian environment where you don't, you know, they're going to be under one meter, they're decorative, you want to be able to use them. So in those instances for low categories, you can, you can use them without verticals. But if you're using a, if you're lighting a low use pathway with a six meter pole, then your low categories of PP4 and five still need to have a vertical requirement. And on surface, the levels look ridiculously low. You can see there for PP5, you're looking at 0 0.02. So something that probably most light meters wouldn't even really be able to measure down to. But what it means in a design perspective when you're, when you're actually calculating these things is the fact that you have to put the vertical grid into your assessment means it restricts how far apart you can put your poles. So it's keeping the grouping of your poles a lot closer together. It's sort of a, a philosophy of less about maximum spacings and more about pooling of light. The, the other way that they're regulating the spacings of poles is by halving the uniformity requirements. So previously, our maximum average was we had to be under 10, and now we have to be under five. So that's a fairly sharp drop, but not something that's, in my experience, particularly difficult to achieve still. And the, so the third safeguard around pole spacings is this new rule about conforming to 50% of your point horizontals, five meters either side of your formed pathway give you an indication of what that is actually talking about. We have an example here of a pathway project where if we're to evaluate the new standard and we look at PP1, then we need to have 10 lux on the, as an average and two as a minimum on the horizontal, which you can see from this example here that we are meeting that criteria. But now the fact that this part D, we need to conform with 50% of our point horizontal levels, five meters either side of the pathway, means that we need to be achieving a minimum of one lux on uh, five meters on one side of the pathway, five meters on the other, which I've demonstrated here is being referred to as PP1 XS1 and PP1 XS2, but they could be called anything from forward spill or back spill. The, the point is, is that you need to set up calculation grids to evaluate what is happening five meters on either side of the pathway. That is a fairly, it's, an, it's another step in the design process that needs to be considered. It's also something that will have an impact potentially on the type of optic that you've traditionally used for a pathway project. Because again, like roads I mentioned before, economy is always seems to be the approach with these things and 
low pole heights, you want to have them spaced as far apart as you can, which means that you end up with very long, for lack of a better term, longitudinal kind of bat wing optics, and they won't produce a lot of forward and back spill. But now the standard's asking you to, to have that. So the type of optics that you will now more than likely need to use for pathway applications is more of these all purpose type distributions, which in North America, they would call a type three. Something that produces a little bit more forward and back spill is something that you're going to have to consider now for projects. And I think the, the idea between the five, the five meters either side, it makes sense. As I said, as I said, economy is always key. Optics always end up being the uh, driving force behind the optics always ain't been, seems to be about getting maximum spacings. And you end up sometimes with this very narrow bandwidth of light, like you see here in image one, where you can't see objects and people coming at you from anywhere other than the forms pathway. And it generally cre creates a bit of a feeling of, unsafeness really it's just uh, not that pleasant to, to be in an environment like that so by creating this five meter rule either side of the pathway you end up with a greater spill zone uh, better visibility on either side of the pathway to be able to identify objects coming at you from different angles and especially if you're at high you know high speeds on bikes or, or running that's very critical as well as the just the crime the crime element of that too that you want to you want to avoid by having better visibility. So it's a principle that makes sense to me. There is some exceptions to it. This highlighted in green here, impact on wildlife is certainly a clause that they've put in here that you can choose to sort of ignore this setback rule. If there's concern about the nocturnal wildlife in the area, it might be that it's a sensitive installation by the water or near a zoo, or there could be any number of animals that you want to be mindful of and considerate of. And in those instances, it really, you want to be putting the least amount of light on your project, on your installation as possible. So you don't really want to pr be promoting unnecessary spill. So they put a clause in there to, you're exempt in those instances. If you have AS428, if you have spill light concerns around neighbors, you would also not be, particularly concerned about this rule or if you had fences that were immediately behind your installation then you wouldn't worry about it either but it's a very general principle but it's a good design philosophy to execute um, if your project allows it public activity areas this one has not seen a great deal of variation from the previous edition of the standard the the terminology has changed as i mentioned previously but otherwise the design parameters are exactly as they were previously, except for the fact that the uniformity has improved from 10 to eight, as is the case on most areas. Connecting elements has seen an additional category. So connecting elements again as a refresher are any stairs, pedestrian walkways, subways or ramps. These are lit to PE subcategory. And previously subways was a P, it was P10, that is now referred to as PE1. And the old P9 standard for stairs is now PE2. But what they've added is this PE3 category, which they've referred to as for ramps and footbridges considered deemed to be low use. Now there isn't really anything in the standard which outlines what is low use, what constitutes low use. So in some ways, I think that's probably still a little bit up to your interpretation as to when you use it. Uh, I'll be guided by whatever category you're lighting your pathway to. So if it's very low PP4 or 5 category, then I would consider lighting also the ramps to something that's, that's considered low use also. What it means is though, by having this extra category, creates it's going to create less contrast because we used to light to P9 for connecting elements, even if it was a low use pathway that it surrounded. But in those instances, then that means that you're lighting one spot centrally like a set of stairs to something that's very bright and then the pathway surrounding it might be very low and that contrast between light and dark and that adaptation of that, that issues that that can cause can be a negative thing so by having a lower design category to meet means that you the whole environment sort of blends in a little bit more seamlessly together and i think that's a that's a good good trait for an institution 
tidy uniformity again when referring to the parameters themselves. Otherwise, subways have stayed exactly the same. As I mentioned, P9, the levels that are now referred to as P2, they are the same. But the PE3 levels are much lower. So you've got three on the horizontal rather than 7.5 on the horizontal minimum and then down to 0 0.1 on the vertical for your compliance is there. So a big drop, um, which, is, which is welcome. So if we move on to car parks now, besides the terminology change to PC1, 2 or 3 or disabled being PCD now, we have a new category to consider. So PCX refers to pedestrian crossings inside car park areas. So this is not a standard that is to replace AS 1158 part four, which is a pedestrian crossing standard designed really for arterial, sub-arterial V category lighting roads. This is not replacing that. This is just for line marked crossings within car park areas like you know, shopping centers, supermarkets. That's what we'll be using this. We're no longer evaluating nighttime occupancy. So again, we've gone from three selection criteria down just to two, which has simplified things. And the justification for why they've removed that is because of this note C here, where they refer to the fact that lighting controls are going to play a big part in your occupancy rates at nighttime now, especially with LED technology, where utilizing controls more. So if a sensor is navigating cars between high and low modes, then there isn't really any need to be designing for it in your criteria. It just muddies the water, and that's another confusing element to, to your selection criteria. So it's a welcome shift, I think, away from that, and, and now just the two um, evaluating criteria. If anybody hasn't designed a external car park before, this is a very good guide that has been retained from the previous edition of the standard, but also updated. These next five images that you'll see are really all the, consider all the areas that you need to consider when you're lighting an outdoor space that you might encounter anyway. So the first is what they refer to as an access roadway. So this is just an internal road around your site that might lead you to the loading dock or to another road, another internal road. When you're designing these internal roads, you only need to comply with 50% of your chosen design category. And you also don't need to evaluate any vertical requirement. It's purely a horizontal assessment on the road and it's to 50% of the levels of your car park. You have to meet the PCD requirements. So you'll need to do dedicated calculations for disabled spaces and typically to meet the requirements in the standard that will result in a dedicated light source that's either a pole or a wall mounted fitting directly on top of the disabled spaces is what you'll, you'll, you'll need to do. The parking aisle and the parking spaces themselves, this is your PC one, two or three design category. This is what you need to govern the bulk of your project. Then you have these things called circulation roadways. So the difference between an access roadway and a circulation roadway is that a circulation roadway will lead you directly to a parking aisle, which will take you to a car park. An access roadway doesn't lead you to a car parking space. So that's how you make the distinction between the two. And for circulation roadways, you want to meet all the horizontal requirements of your standard. So that's again, going to be PC one two, or three, but you don't need to worry about any verticals for those, for those elements. And then we have this new line marked crossing PCX category. So these are the five zones that you'll encounter for an external environment. And um, again, very handy reference point for you. And if we look at the actual design parameters versus the previous edition of the standard, again, uniformity has been improved. Otherwise, there isn't a great deal of change here. Everything is as per it was previously, except you'll notice the old P11B standard at a minimum of 1.5 lux on the horizontal, on the vertical, and that's now down to one. So a little bit easier to comply there. But the big, the big one to point out is this new PCX category. It doesn't have any verticals that you need to meet, but it does have very high horizontal levels, very high minimum horizontal levels, much, much greater than anything that's in PC1, you'll see. So this will be the area that 
for safety, it makes sense that you're really trying to highlight those line marked areas where people are crossing. The fact that there's no vertical seems a bit odd, but in essence, I think your levels on the horizontal are so high that you will have good visibility vertically anyway. But because you have these high levels to meet, what you'll find is, is that you really will have to have a dedicated light source very close to the crossing, similarly to how you would, for a you would treat a disabled space. You're going to have to have something within close proximity to pick up those minimum levels of five and those averages of 21, which are quite high for an external area. Especially if you consider it against a PC3 category that's very low, it'll be it'll really stand out and be quite bright. So that's, that covers all the design parameters and the changes there. The next part is sort of a little bit more, a little bit more of a deeper dive. The next two slides I'm going to show you are around new glare metrics that are really going to have a very big impact on how you approach your designs going forward. This is, uh, these next two slides are a little bit messy, but we'll go through them and um, certainly open to questions at the end. But there's going to need to be a lot of, um, uh, a lot of conversations and just a lot of, uh, you know, with your lighting suppliers that you're using, just to make sure that you're covering all the bases as part of the new standard requirements. So this is going to be a bit of an ongoing evaluation, these next two slides, but I'll jump into them. So in essence, table 3.8 is the first one we'll look at, and this is called the limitation of luminous intensity. So intensity is essentially glare. It's how bright our light fixes are. And how bright they are is a metric uh, that we is, is assessed. Um, the unit is called candelas. So in the standard, it's the standard is basically asking us to, with whatever light fitting we've chosen, we need to measure how bright or how glary that light source is. And we're measuring it between a couple of different beam angles. We're looking for the maximum brightness value between 80 and 90 degrees. And then we're looking for the maximum brightness value at 90. And it essentially just needs to be under the table that we've got here, the absolute values that are in the table. So if you have a lumen package for your light fitting that's less than 4,000, then you have an absolute value. If your lumen package for your light fitting is greater than 4,000, you've got this ratio of 180 candelas per 1,000 lumens or 80 candelas per 1,000 lumens that you need to be under. This is something in order to evaluate for someone like myself is very easy but it does require you, if you want to do it yourself, to really have access to an IS file viewer. So that's going to be something like a photometric toolbox, which is a sort of a plugin as part of the AGI lighting software, um, or something else, Stylux might have something similar that you can really kind of scrutinize all the different angles and what brightness values there are at each angle. But basically, you're going to look at, you're going to look at your light fitting that you've chosen, and we say, we take the street, street light as an example, it's over 4,000 lumens. So we need to times 180 candelas per 1,000 for every 1,000 lumens that we have for this particular product. And that will give us a candela value, a maximum value that you see there in green, which is 1,147. So essentially we need to take that value and then assess it against the performance in, of the photometry. And you'll see on the left here, just immediately under that no tilt, that we're, we're looking at between 80 and 90 degrees in this instance for this particular optic. You'll see that the maximum candela value, that brightness value we have is 347. So it's well and truly under 1147 candelas. And what you'll probably find is most lighting suppliers really, sh this is more of a formality than anything. It's not going to be a big issue that a lot of um, suppliers will will come up against, but it's more what we've, what we've found with this is that sometimes there'll be certain optics that are not, no longer suitable. And usually it's the ones that are for those road type of applications I was mentioning previously, where the philosophy around the optic is more about maximizing pole spacings. So to do that, it means you need to have a very high amount of light in the vertical component and to kick the lights further. So sometimes that can result in high brightness values between 80 and 90 degrees. And they're the optics that you might see. Uh, you need to kind of question pretty much, pretty much anything else in its photometered horizontal position should be pretty safe from, from uh, this particular metric. 
as I said, it's mainly going to be a formality more than anything, except for a few optics. Where it gets a little bit messier is table 3.9. There's an extra level of detail now. So now we're talking about discomfort glare classes, DG1 or DG2. So we're still talking candelas, we're still talking how bright our light source is, but where table 3.8 was just asking us to assess how bright our light source was between 80 and 90 degrees, this next table 3.9 is asking us to evaluate how bright our fitting is between 65 degrees and 85 degrees. So it's a much bigger area that we're now assessing for how bright our light source is. And depending on the category, the subcategory, PA, roundabouts, roads and pathways, there's a different set of uh, DGI max values, a maximum candela value that you have to be under. So, the higher the light, the, the light pole, and uh, I guess the less sensitive the application, the, the, the higher the allowance is for how bright the light fittings can be. But you'll see for as you get closer to the ground and the, the projects are a little bit more sensitive, like for PR and PP, where the, the categories are um, 35,000 max candelas is the, the tightest requirement there. So um, the higher the pole scheme, the more flexibility you're given. But this is by no means a guarantee of compliance. And what we have to do is essentially as lighting suppliers, when we're doing a design for you or um, doing it for yourself, we need to really be assessing every optic and wattage in our arsenal that we would normally supply for you and make sure that it's meeting this requirement. And I can definitely tell you the rules start to it definitely will affect um, your go-to optics and your normal products that you would select. You definitely need to be asking the question as to whether or not they comply anymore. It's a relatively sort of comp uh, probably could be straightforward for for a lot of you to be fair, but in order in order for how we actually arrive at this discomfort glare value, what we're really asking, what the standard is asking us to measure, is essentially the length and the width of our what they call the LED array, the luminous area. So the opening where the light comes out of, we need to know what that area is. Then we need to know what the peak value, the, what that peak candela value is between 65 and 85 degrees. And then we need to put it into a formula that will then tell us the result. Now the standard has tried to be as accommodating as possible, understanding that you know, every lighting supply is going to have a slightly different optical platform. And how we measure the luminous area, that opening where the LED, where the light comes out of, is going to differ between products and, and manufacturers. So all these different ways of measure, measuring the luminous area have been outlined in the standard, which is great. So plenty of information to actually achieve the calculations, but there's a lot of work behind the scenes. And a lot of this information is not necessarily going to be something from um, you know, an engineering perspective that you'll have access to, but you'll be reliant on your lighting supplier to be able to give you. If we perform a DGI example here, and we, again, as I said, we're taking the length and the width, the luminous area, the luminous opening, we're finding the peak intensity and at what angle it is, uh, it is at, and we're putting it into the formula. This is just a product example here on the right of achieving the length and the width. It will tell you when you put it all into the formula what the DGI max value is. And in this instance, this is a, a bat wing optic. It's 53 watts, so it's fairly low, and it's producing 32,800 candelas. So if you cross reference that value to table 3.9, you'll see what. Uh, applications and what mounting heights that particular optic and wattage is now suitable for. So in this instance, 32,800 is conveniently, uh, you know, under for the sake of today, is under all of those thresholds. So it could be used anywhere. But the nature, you know, the relationship between, you know, lumens and candelas is, you know, one for one. It's as, you, as the fittings get bright, as, more, as there's more light, they're brighter. So as you kind of go up in wattage, you'll start to see that there'll be things that you'll no longer be compliant, there'll be categories that you'll no longer be compliant for. As you change optics, you'll notice that there will be certain optics that won't be suitable now for certain applications. 
that they were previously. The only caveat to this that I just will mention is I did I did sit in on an IES meeting recently where there was mention of the fact that there might be some amendments to this DGI calculator in the sense that PA public activity areas and PC public car parks, the DGI metrics that they've put here in table 3.9, uh, one or two things is likely to happen to them. They'll either be revised or they might be removed completely. They're not going to be, roads and pathways will definitely be staying, but whether or not activity areas and car parks stays as part of this DGI requirement is still remains to be seen. It's not, not gospel that it will be here forever. So just something, for now we have to design to it, uh, but it might be something that gets removed in the future. Upward waste light is a new metric for 1158. This is not new to AS4282, it's not new to Green Star. There's always variations of it across a number of different standards, but we're now evaluating it for 1158, which makes sense. The metrics are a little bit different. So we are measuring up upward waste light emitted by the luminaire itself. So it's not a total of the area, it's specific to the luminaire and whether you're non-solid state lighting, so really anything that's not LED or SSL, solid state lighting, LED products, whether it's a local road or a public activity area, you've got a different set of metrics that you need to be under, whether it's 1% or 3%. And a good, another progressive, you know, positive step, we, we have too much spill light in the environment as it is and there's very big pushes to, to mitigate that and by making sure that we're controlling tilt angles uh, that's the first step and making sure that we don't put unnecessary light up into the environment so positive move but when we're evaluating just to clarify what up with light waste light is and how it's how it's evaluated you'll see different optics there in blue but this dotted line essentially represents the horizontal plane where the light is and as the fittings have the potential to be tilted in most cases, as you begin to tilt, that light becomes cl closer and closer to sort of crossing that horizontal threshold and spilling light north. So really the best design approach is to, to not design with tilts at all. Um, but if you have to, then you're nominating the tilt angles on your specification and um, being very mindful of the fact that it won't, take a lot to actually fail 1% up light in most, in most cases. There's, there's ways to check in computer software like AGI 32, there's ways to evaluate spill light. There's also, you can use photometry viewers, photometry toolbox, anything that will kind of give you the breakdown of how much light comes out of the fitting at different angles. So if you have a look on the left here where the red arrow is pointing towards, Within this table, you'll see very high, so forward very high, between 80 and 90 degrees. This optic that's nominated here has 1.3% of its light in that bandwidth between 80 and 90 degrees. So as you start to tilt your fitting, that will be the element that starts to cross that horizontal threshold. So a 10% 10, 10 tilt, 10 degree tilt, you're looking at probably around 1% um, of upward light. So you really are quite, you know, bound by horizontal designs for the most part. But in essence, if you see a project out on site that's been tilted severely, 20 degrees, 15 degrees or more, then it's more than likely not, not complying with upward waste light as part of the standard. The light loss factor methodology, how we calculate our, our maintenance factor has been updated. We have some redefined subcategories, so rural and urban versus the old high, medium or low. We also don't have the IP5X evaluation category anymore. We're just looking at IP65 fittings seems to be the recommendation from the, from the standard that that's what we should be using externally. So anything that's 5X is irrelevant. And the cleaning frequency is out to um, 72 months, really, more than likely because of the advent of LED technology, the lamp replacements are down, but the, the light is staying on for a lot longer and less servicing. So a longer cleaning frequency has been included with reduced um, depreciation factors to accommodate that. 
when referring to solid state lighting, the, the standard now references positive steps in terms of uh, the information that's needed for you to accurately calculate that. It's suggesting that we have the LM80 documentation and the TM21 reports so that we can accurately assess the depreciation of our product in conjunction with those depreciation factors. But it's also put in here uh, an interesting sort of wrinkle, I guess. It, this is where sometimes standards are open interpretation and how you actually, how you interpret this particular part of the standard is, is really sort of up, up to you. But it's a little bit misleading. It talks about the fact that the testing of the LEDs needs to be conducted at an ambient temperature of 40 degrees for Australia, which not everybody has depreciation data that goes up to 40 degrees that they can, they can provide. Some suppliers do. If you take this as an example though, the, the one thing it's a bit of a, to the, a little bit confusing is whether or not you just need to produce TM21 documentation that demonstrates the fitting's been tested, or whether you're also supposed to base your maintenance factor off a 40 degree ambient. Because LEDs really don't like the heat, they perform really well in the cold, they don't work very well. Uh, in extreme temperatures. So as they get hotter, they just don't perform as well. So if you start calculating based on a high ambient temperature, then you'll end up with a much lower maintenance factor than potentially you, know, you might think is acceptable. If we reference this 40 degrees, as I've pointed here, and we, as we work on a 72 month cleaning cycle there for an urban environment on the bottom left, and we look at 75,000 hours of compliance, the red circle is, then when you calculate everything out, you end up with a maintenance factor of 0.69. So based on a 40 degree ambient for 75,000 hours, which would represent you know 15 plus years for, for a nighttime application. So 0.7, some people feedback, you know, conservative, some people think um, it's bang on. It's really sort of, uh, I guess, up to you how, you how you approach that. But the one other takeaway from this is that the previous 2005 edition used to tell you that there was a, a hard cap on 0.8 as a design maintenance factor, that you could not exceed that for external fittings. That is no longer part of the standard. So in essence, depending on how you balance out your cleaning frequency versus the actual project life cycle of your job, uh, you might find that you end up with a maintenance factor higher than 0.8, which in, by this version of the standard is also acceptable as well. So that's, that's important to, to point out. Light source requirements, this slide is in here purely because in the draft edition of the standard, there was a note that stated 4,000 Kelvin was going to be the maximum recommended color temperature. So nothing over cool white, basically, but that has since been removed. So there is no limitations surrounding what color temperature light fittings you use externally. But just to point out that the industry is certainly moving towards warmer color temperatures, whether they be 3000 Kelvin or 2700 or even you know, monochromatic reds and ambers for, for specific external applications as well. So uh, the idea behind that is that animals are governed by the moon and the bluer the spectral content of your LED light source, the, the greater the potential for them to be navigated by the light rather than by the moon, which is how they've always innately navigated. So that can lead to a lot of issues. And by reducing the blue spectrum content, by designing with more warmer color tones, you sort of mitigate that blue effect. So that is the shift that we see in the industry and certainly something to consider now for you know, pretty much all your external lighting applications. But that's it. That's everything, guys. That sort of touches on, I think, most most areas of the standard. And yeah, we're open to any, any questions if anybody has them. Thank you, Peter. That was very informative. And um, yeah, I learned a lot. And I'm, all I can say is I'm glad I, I'm a commissioning manager and not a lighting designer. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you able to see anybody raising their hand or putting questions? Okay. Um... Let me have a look here. Participants, Q and A. Uh, no one's been... put the hand up yet. No, no one's. I haven't got anybody. I can check the chats. That um, that the last bit about moonlight mm -hmm. 
and light fittings. How how have we worked out that the um, the wildlife is affected by those differing um, um, color colors? I guess would you call it? Yeah. Well, yeah. You, well, you really would. You like yeah. I guess their their field of like their spectral field. You know, they're sensitive to light in slightly different wavelengths of light than than we are as humans. Um, there's actually at the end of the there's the other standard that we do a presentation on this, this AS4282 standard, which just talks about the acoustic lighting effects on the external environment. Actually has um, a couple of pages around um, how they've actually, some of the research that's been done to sort of show the sensitivity of different types of insects and, and animal life and how, um, yeah, I guess just through, you know, Science is probably above me, Tony, but yeah, they've been able to at least evaluate that um, the, the bandwidth of light is more more blue, more sensitive to certain spectrums. So, by eliminating that, you're um, you know you're helping them to orientate themselves in nighttime correctly. But but yeah, there's 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 other there's a couple of other standards. There's like a national. Uh, I'm going, definitely going to mess up the name which is uh, terrible, but there is another wildlife guideline, design guideline for external lighting, which, which goes into much greater detail. It's a rather large document. So there's extra, there's extra course reading, which I can certainly recommend to anybody that wants to dig a bit deeper. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. We also got a question there. I don't know if you can see it, but... Um... Yes, what lighting software programs yep. currently produce results in compliance with the new standard? So... Um, really, I mean, all of this is essentially still up to the designer. There's, um, there's no, for, uh, for 1158 part, part three for this new standard, I mean, the way that you set up your calculation grids, um, whether it be in Dialux uh, or whether it be in AGI 32, it's still, you know, the ownership is really still on you as a designer to basically set up those grids and then compare them to um, the standard and make sure you're hitting your compliances. In terms of... Um, all the glare metric stuff that I spoke about, the table 3.8 and 3.9, there isn't uh, really one specific lighting software that's actually going to sort of evaluate for you and tell you this automatically complies. That would be something that you really kind of need to have dedicated software to review the UIS photometry yourself. Um, so really, yeah, I hope that, I hope that answers the question really. And of course, um, Jeff Robinson's asked a question about external lighting and safety. So, okay, so, yeah. <laughs> so, can um, you talk to that? Yeah, well, not really. I mean, I, I think the interesting thing was was more um, when I sat in on this IES. Um, I sat in this IES course from uh, Steve Jenkins, who was one of the authors of this new standard. Um, he did he did mention how yeah the, the shift of fear of crime that was always part of the old standard, but I think bringing it to the forefront was because of that fact is that they just found that over lighting spaces and certain color temperatures at nighttime weren't really resulting in any safer, necessarily safer environments. And there's been studies done by um, Tim Hunt and Harrop, and there's a few other sort of good ones out there where they've, they've spoken to certain uh, sectors of the marketplace and evaluated you know, how, you know, sometimes that, you know, the, the feedback has been that sometimes when a space is really well lit, uh, it actually makes them feel less likely to go into it because they feel like there's something wrong with the area and it's overlit for that reason that I'm not actually safe here. Um, so it's a purely a psychological thing. I think external lighting and safety, it's a really, really hard one. It's, it's, I think it could be quite, it can be quite subjective and that's why they've changed terminology. Um, I'm always a fairly risk averse person, especially as a lighting designer. Unfortunately, we deal a lot with clients that don't really, um, don't really know or understand the lighting side of things. And we're expected to provide them with a compliant solution, obviously. But you know, as a risk-averse society, we always sort of tend to go to um, the higher light, you know, design to the higher light levels to keep everybody safe, which is not you know, necessarily uh, sometimes the, the best approach. I think really good progressive approach is um, yeah to use dynamic lighting to use things like motion and sensors to alert people to something moving in a space, or um, you know, accounting on reflecting surfaces of other properties, which can really help, um, you know, in integrating other areas and lighting other other parts rather than just the forms pathway, but lighting things like 
the trees and the surrounding pathways, so, you know, adjoining that pathway, they're all good design approaches to, um, to kind of enhancing a feeling of safety. So a bit more spill, really, um, I think is, is, is really welcome. And the standards address that, so. Perfect. Um, what about sodium lights? What's that? Do you still, uh, well, still the, a place for them? Yeah, well, so I guess, yeah, incumbent, you know, technology, but it's, um, I think there's a, I think there's an application for, for all lighting really. And, um, and we're still using, uh, you know, metal halide for a lot of sports lighting applications because just purely for the use, um, that's, you know, I guess, uh, the hours that they're used and how, how cost effective they could be that they, they still get used. I think, is there still a place for sodium? I think definitely like, you know, lamp life's obviously excellent. Color rendering is not, not so great, but there's always an application for everything. I think it's more, not so much is there a place for it, but more just whether or not you will be able to get it, you know? Like, I mean, I know that the company that I, that I work for, we, we had quite big in, in metal halide technology back in the day. And um, it's more, more just getting more and more difficult to, have, to find and source the components to service them. So even if there is a place, I think we're just finding that the market is just moving so far away from it that they're just getting very difficult to service and, uh, and to support the warranties when you can't, you can't bring the product in. So unfortunately, I think those things are just phased out and, there's, and, and whether there's a place or not, there's not much that we can do from a uh, lighting supply perspective when the industry is all going in the other direction. Yeah, fair enough, good answer. We've got one last question there. Um, Oh, the second last. Oh, no, there's a couple there. Um, there's a couple there. Yeah, the perfect light one's an interesting one. So, yeah, for, for you know, pathway and road, road based calculations, we have always used perfect light, which is, you know, very basic, but an excellent, excellent software. Um, I, the last time I'd heard was that they were supposed to be, there was supposed to be an update to perfect light that had the new standard plugged into it. But I don't use the software regularly enough to know whether or not that's actually been executed yet. But I know the intention was certainly for perfect light to be updated. Um, and then what is, what is my favorite light fitting? Really my favorite light fitting is whatever the client's favorite light fitting is. <laughs> so whatever, you know, whatever, whatever they want, whatever, I, for me, the end result is really, you know, by being involved, by being engaged directly with, with the client and, and having them happy with the result, you know, regardless of, of, of what it is, if good design philosophy has been executed, you know, and it, it makes sense, makes sense for the job you've met your requirements um, and the client's happy. I'm, I'm very uh, agnostic with, with that regards. So um, just looking for a, a positive end result. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and Chandana's got an interesting question there too. Okay. Practically, how do we verify the design once it's installed to prove the compliance is met? Yeah, really, really, really difficult. Um, is it still enough to prove it with the design documents? See, for, for some things like AS4282, this uh, obtrusive light standard, you are just evaluating in a vacuum. You know, you're not, they specifically mention in the standard that um, this is not something that could be measured in the field for a number of reasons. And things like can, candela values, you know, you can't measure brightness effectively externally and, and measure the, the amount of light coming out of a light source. It's not, it's no practical way to do it. So, a lot of it does then fall back onto paper compliance, but as we know, what, what ends up out on the field is so different to what we've actually, sometimes what we've actually documented. So the, the hard answer is like, is really unfortunately, unfortunately no. there's things to check compliance, like turning off the lighting installation. Uh, you can measure, get a baseline for a result and then turn the installation back on and see what the disparity is between the two, at least from a lux level horizontal lux level perspective you can do that in terms of glare as i said it's very very difficult in terms of tilt angles it's some a little bit straightforward i think um as i said really anything that i've found that's tilted sort of beyond 15 degrees is really potentially going to start failures and that's something you can almost eyeball to know whether or not it's going to fail um those upward light components and also the glare because as you as we said, like with the horizontal threshold, as you tilt it more and more, um, you, the, you're getting more of that peak intensity in that, that problem range uh, for table 3.8 and 3.9. So um, identifying tilts is like just a really obvious one that you can do. You've got your lux meters, but really the rest of it does seem to fall to, to paper compliance and, and scrutinizing how the, how the design's been and how all the grids and everything's been set up properly to meet. 
um, in your experience, how has the new standard impacted on the compliance to 4282? Um, like in some ways, I think it's, it really hasn't sort of changed, it hasn't really sort of changed my, my design approach too much at all. Um, there's things that you can do for 4282 uh, in terms of keeping lights at, like away from certain boundaries just through good design principles and understanding how to set up your vertical compliance grids that um, for your power park or whatever it might be that um, you can really sort of avoid a lot of issues. I haven't, I haven't found 4282 to be proved to be too more difficult because as we've said, for roads where they've promoted, they've suggested better spill, they've also said that you could ignore it. For 4282. The pathways, same sort of thing. I mean, as, as far as 4282 is concerned, they're supposed to be exempt because they're for all night safety. So um, again, not something that you know, certainly can consider, but you don't necessarily have to, to follow it to the letter of the law. So, I mean, it's, yeah, sort of project specific, but no, I haven't seen anything to, to too much yet that's really um, affected compliance. So how do you measure point zero point zero two lux? Well, exactly right. And that's the thing is, I mean, most light meters aren't sensitive enough to do it. And and the you know when when you're measuring four two eight two, as I said before, when they they talk about infield measurements, they say that there's there's so many different factors that can influence light meter readings externally. Whether there's an object obstructing your vision, you know, where you where you're assessing, or you've got your head over the light meter, or you've got the you know, full moon ambient light from existing installations. It's really, you know, it's really, really hard to do. And that, that really comes, that's what I sort of said before, was that it really comes down to um, that metric, I feel like is purely in there from a design perspective to force you to keep, to control your pole spacings and to keep them closer together to create more of a pooling effect of light because practically it makes no sense. So the only reason I can see for it to make sense is in the design space. That's it. Um, okay. Uh, can't be. Yeah. So. Um, How competitors with cheap and cheerful lights. It's, yeah. I mean, all the time. I mean, it's you know, it, I never, I very, very seldomly lose projects to the, you know, to the the top end of town. You know, we're all sort of in a very similar sort of boat in terms of the, all the good quality lighting manufacturers, and we're all sort of in the same, you know, in the same situation where there's just um, there's a lot of there's a lot of junk out there and it's really really hard to to regulate and i agree like you know, sometimes these standards don't necessarily help you but i think one thing that could be very interesting is especially surrounding table 3.8 and 3.9 uh the way you guys document your projects um you could building building that into the specification that the, it has to meet these ltps for for glare and then any alternatives need to be able to demonstrate that they can effectively achieve those results, I think might weed out a bit of the competition that has, you know, sort of inferior optics and, you know, we're using really high wattages to achieve the same project results that you might achieve with half the output, you know. They, they might, you might just find that, I, I think that that sort of hanging on to those glare metrics that are, that are new to the standard might be one way to really sort of uh, try to weed out some of that element. And that's what I'm really hoping for, and sort of, I guess, encouraging people to, to think about. Um, but there's a big education process with that glare stuff, which still needs to happen. Um, but but that's that's definitely sort of where I'm where I'm trying to go with it. And Patrick's got a nice, good question here. I've got no hey. idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Patrick. Um, how accurate is AJM modeling during the design stage as compared to agile? Yeah, good question. I can't, I always put this on my design, Patrick. Um, there is, a, there is a tolerance that's outlined in the Australian standards, which um, tells you, you know, within sort of 10% or whatever it is, there's, there's, there's a, there is a, um, definitely a buffer that exists between AGI space and real world, uh, the calculation. And I feel like it's something around 10% variation. I can definitely pull out the clause for you because it's on all my lighting designs, Patrick, but I just can't remember the, the exact reference. I always just put it on there to, to make sure we're covered. But yeah, there is probably maybe a discrepancy or an allowable discrepancy, put it that way, at, at I think up to about 10%. So if it's, if that's a consideration, then I would say that's probably more than likely the answer. So there's, um, sometimes it can go the other way though, can't it? If you've got, as I said, a full moon or a bright installation next to you, it might actually enhance your results. So it's, um, 
very difficult. Um, okay. Fast forward 10 years. Fast forward, perhaps. Okay. Fast forward 10 years, where do you see the evolution of the standard with relation to light levels and lamp temperature? What would you like to see? Yeah, I think um, to see the evolution of this standard, I think one of the big things that would be really helpful is considering to some extent reflectances externally. Um, at the moment, we, we calculate based on direct only. We're just measuring what's hitting the surface, not what's bouncing off it. But in reality, I don't know how you can accurately you know, measure upward light um, and how you can sort of ignore those external components like you know bitumen and, and grass or they might you know you might be feature lighting a, a facade that's all going to sort of incorporate be incorporated into um, the final light level results that you're going to see out on site and I think that that would I would like to see it get a little bit even more progressive where we, where we start to um, evaluate some of those or we're allowed to consider some of those like sort of full radiosity reflectance calculations um, because that will really result in less light um, which I think is you know there's definitely a positive thing, as we said, there's no correlation between more light and safety. So having it sort of more dynamic and, and reflecting to calculate, I think would be great. Warmer CCTs, certainly everybody likes that. So making a bit more of a hard stance on recommended color temperatures externally, I think would be good. Um, it's always hard putting hard and fast sanctions on things, but pushing the industry towards more 2700 and, and warmer color temperatures, I think is, is really welcome. Everybody loves, loves a warm, warmly lit external space they're going to spend more time in it so i think between those two things radiosity calcs and maybe warmer color temperature sort of stipulations and guidelines would be would be really good to see um, with the new emerging optic technologies example optic waveguides etc how do we apply the standard for these so um well i guess for yeah, I mean, I guess for waveguides, it's no real. It's not really dissimilar. I mean, you've got your luminous area, and you can still, you know, if it's in a street light form, you can still very much measure the luminous area, the opening. Even if the light source is direct, it's really about. It's not just about the LED. It's about the whole surface that it's that it's coming out of. So you really want to evaluate that entire surface. Um, and so that's easy enough to do. You can, you can measure that physically, or the IS file photometry can also give you the luminous area that it was calculated with. So that's, if, if you're in doubt and you, and you don't have any, any answer, then referring to the luminous area in your like photometric toolbox is the perfect example. It gives you that information. So if you don't know, base it off that. That would be my, my suggestion. And one last question from about big road lamp replacement program big in Australia. What's that about? Replacement. I feel like it's almost done now. I mean, I'm as this standard was you'd sort of allude to is I'm a little bit more of a P category guy. So that's that is that is more a road V category uh, lighting question, and I sort of understand the principles. But sort of how how far through that uh, upgrade process they are. Um, I don't know. I saw. I think I saw. You know, even um, Warnable recently award another. They're going to upgrade another thousand street lights to LED, which would, I think, almost sort of fulfil their obligation for their whole their whole area in terms of road lighting. So, it's been a well-established market in Australia for you know really the last seven eight years, probably even maybe potentially even longer than that. So, that process is really sort of I think you know well and truly underway, and it's probably more on the the other side of the curve than anything. Um, so yeah, yeah. A, a sort of a fairly fairly uh, exhausted space I feel like for the most part from my understanding. No worries. Thank you Peter. Um, no problem. Just like to thank you for a very informative uh, presentation. I certainly learned a lot tonight and um, Welcome. lots of interest from the questions so um, thank you very much and no. um, ordinarily we would uh, have a little presentation for you but um, it's a bit hard <laughs> to do that virtually. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I'll take a uh, I'll take a virtual high five or something. That's, that's, that's plenty. <laughs> okay, good on you, Peter. Well, no thanks everyone for attending, and um, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. And um, on behalf of the SIBSI committee, I'd like to thank you for taking the time and effort to to uh, help us understand pedestrian lighting standards upgrade. No, you're more than welcome. Thank you very All much for the opportunity. All right, thanks, Peter. Good evening, and good evening.